So, Turing completeness. I went down a rabbit hole of what is Turing complete in like the summer. And I wanted to share it all with you guys because it was very weird. So what does it mean to be Turing complete? Well, to be Turing complete, you need to be able to simulate a Turing machine. And what a Turing machine is, it's something that can take a program, run it, and then produce an output from that program. So this is all well and good, but then you have a universal Turing machine, which can take any program, not just a specific one, run it, and then produce an output. And what this means is that it can compute anything that is computable. Often they're represented like this. So it's a tape which represents the instructions and then just some black box that then goes into it to record and edit the instructions. And we say something is Turing complete if it can simulate a universal Turing machine, which can therefore simulate any Turing machine you throw at it. So which means it can compute anything that is computable, i.e. it is an all-powerful computer. However, there are some limitations and what something that is true and complete can be in this world. The main thing is infinity. In our world, just infinity kind of just doesn't exist. So, but however, Turing machines are defined theoretically and thus they can do infinite time, as in they can compute for as long as they need to. And they also have infinite memory, which means that the program that we input to, into them can be as much as we want. Obviously, we live in a world run by physics, which kind of sucks. So we define like an acceptable limitations as in if it can use, theoretically use an infinite amount of memory and can compute in an infinite amount of time, theoretically. What might happen is you might have some nerds come up to you and say something along the lines of lazy evaluation, infinite lists. For one, they're just that, nerds. And for two, the language that they're using that can do lazy evaluation and stuff like that is still running on a, a physical computer. It doesn't matter. It's still bounded by the laws of physics. You can still get memories in Haskell. Now that we know what Turing completeness is, let's have a look at things that are Turing complete and in order of least to most cast. So first we have logic gates. Logic gates make the most sense. They're like the foundation of a CPU. So it kind of makes sense that they're Turing complete. However, so in order to prove that, we need to prove two things. One, that they can store programs in memory, which we can do because flip-flops exist. That's how memory is stored in your computer. And then we need to show that they can do comparisons, which obviously they can. They're logic gates, like you've got and and not and or. These are just comparisons. As some of you may know who have done like some kind of architecture course, actually most of these are irrelevant. We, to be honest, we only really need the NAND gate. And the reason for that is, is that every gate can be made up using a NAND gate. We can make a NOT gate by piping a NAND gate into a NAND gate. We can make an AND gate by piping two AND gates into each other. This will appear a lot in like how we prove something is true and complete by like the general proof will be, we prove that we can simulate a NAND gate and therefore it's true and complete. So the next logical step up from, from uh, logic gates is into assembly. So assembly and machine code have a one-to-one -one relationship and it's much easier to prove that assembly is Turing complete and thus we prove that machine code is Turing complete. So the way we can prove assembly is Turing complete is, as I said, it has an AND gate function through AND, it has a negate function to make a NOT gate, smush those two together into a NAND gate and then boom, we have a NAND gate, therefore Turing completeness. Uh, assembly, like many other languages, has other functions as well because programming with NAND gates is going to be a pain in the ass. And so it has various other functions that allow us to basically make our code neater and more readable. So for example, this code determines whether a number is prime or not. Other things that it should compete are most of your favorite programming languages. So for example, Java, Python, Rust, all of these are Turing complete. Um, the reason for it, again, they can form AND operations through selection. They can form NOT operations with like most of the time like an exclamation mark or just NOT. And so they're Turing complete. Importantly, they can allocate to infinite memory because of their various memory management systems. This will come up later. So those are all the things that like make sense that Turing complete, but I promise you curse things. So I will start with some fairly obviously Turing complete things. So. The first one is Minecraft. 
Uh, Minecraft has redstone, which you can implement various logic gates. Middle left on those is a NAND gate and NAND gate Turing completeness. Because some of the redstone community in Minecraft is insane and has way too much time in the comes, a user called Samurai made this. It is a one hertz computer, fully programmable, built entirely in Minecraft. Yeah, it's a thing. Another game that's Turing complete through logic gates is City Skylines. It's less obvious how you make a logic gate in City Skylines, but you can. It requires firstly the power plant and also sewage. Power plants in order to run will require clean water and sewage and water towers can provide clean water, sewage pipes can provide sewage, but they both need power as well. And so this duality means you can make logic gates. So you can make an AND gate by just having a power station that if you don't provide it sewage or water in enough, it will just deactivate. And so the only way to get an output from the power station in the middle is if you have both clean water provided by power and sewage, which is provided by power. You can also make a knock gate by flooding a power station. It will produce power if there's no power going into the pump because then it's not flooded. But then if it is flooded, i.e. there's power going into the pump, it will not output. And so we have a knock gate, which then again, combined NAND true and complete. So people have made things like that. So for example, someone made a four bit adder, which I think that is, which is kind of cool. Next up, we have PowerPoint and Excel and various other Microsoft products. What these do is these have what are called macros and what macros are, are little bits of embedded VBA code that you can put into your Word documents, your PowerPoint presentation, etc. What VBA is, is a visual basic, but it's got like specific modules to help it interface with PowerPoint and Word better so that you provide more control and your code becomes easier to write. As an aside, this is used a lot in, for like malicious purposes to deliver a payload to someone. So you email them a Word document, which has a macro that runs upon the Word document being opened. Macros can be used for good though. So for example, in my previous lightning talk, which was on how computers tell time is, I showed how the Unix timestamp would relate to the current real world clock. And to do that, I use the code here to take the clock of my computer and convert it into its timestamp. On the subject of embedding code, a lot of Nintendo games have a series of bugs that allow you to inject code into the memory of the game, into the underlying hardware. And then from there, you can run your own code inside the game, which allows you to do some fun things. Famously, a YouTuber named Seth Bling um, managed to inject the code for Flappy Bird into Super Mario Bros. And then this allowed him to obviously play Flappy Bird in Super Mario Bros. Another famous one is Pokemon Yellow, where through his 12 minutes worth of memory injection, you can create this scene to appear. What's important about those balloons, though, is that they don't appear anywhere in the game. You can get stuff that doesn't appear in the game to appear thanks to memory injection. There is some debate about whether this is true in completeness or not, because you're not really interfacing with the game, you're just interfacing with the underlying hardware. But I thought it was cool, so I put it in my presentation. So next up is assembly, but we already covered this, so why am I covering it again? Well, you have the entire x86 instruction set here, but it turns out that's kind of redundant. You only really, you only need the mov command. And someone wrote a very long paper on this, a guy called Stephen Dolan, about how mov is Turing complete. And one of my favorite lines from this paper is that he was, he says the x86 instruction set is both baroque, overcomplicated, and redundantly redundant. To summarize this paper quite briefly is, Basically, you can abuse addressing modes in X in the MOV command in x86 assembly to to obviously store values because it's MOV, like it's used to store values. But also, you can store values in registers and like compare them and combine them through various like addressing modes, which allows you to do comparisons and therefore you have true incompleteness. Because computer scientists are insane, someone made something called MOVUSCATOR which what it does is it takes some input of x86 assembly code, so for example, the code I showed you earlier, and converts it into mov commands. This was written by a guy called Jorajarish. That's probably my best pronunciation I'm ever gonna make of that. And so any program that's written in assembly can be converted into mov. So fun fact, C in the process of its compilation is compiled into C code and there's some there's a flag in GCC where you could stop it at the assembly thing. Also fun fact, 
Doom is written in C, which means that you can write Doom entirely using mov commands, which is kind of cool. However, from the person that made this, requires somewhat increased patience. The reason being is because rather than rendering in frames per second, it renders in frame per hours, which, yeah, is not a good gaming experience. And on the subject of Doom, um, Doom is true and complete, because why wouldn't it be? Um, the way it's true and complete is through monsters and triggers. So you have triggers that can trigger various changes in the map, and you have monsters which can trigger triggers. And because you can make your own maps, you can abuse this. So that is an AND gate, which is where you basically have, if a monster goes into each of the two like blocks on the top, they will open the two doors in the bottom to allow a monster to go through, an AND gate. You also have a NOT gate, which is kind of difficult to see, but it basically works by using like a ditch or a trench. And so that is how you make a NOT gate, command the two, an AND gate, true and complete. So intermission, I was saying how some of our favorite program languages are true and complete, but there's one big exception, C. It's not true and complete. And the reason why is because of pointers. So pointers in the spec of C have a defined size. C has a finite memory space. And so you only have a finite number of pointers and therefore you have a finite memory space, which means even though we technically could allocate to infinity, we can't because of the way that C is specced which means that C is not Turing complete. And now we move on to the really cursed stuff. So firstly, black holes. Black holes, as we all know, or any of us that have taken A-level physics have known, is information goes into them. What you also might know, if you've read anything about Stephen Hawking's work, is that radiation will also come out of them as part of Hawking radiation. And what we initially thought was this was random, but thanks to 4,200 words of quantum physics that I didn't understand at all, but apparently it means that maybe there's some processing going on, which means we can't definitely prove that a black hole is not a computer. So they could just be computers in disguise. And then the final thing that I want to show you that's really cursed and complete is this presentation. So PowerPoint has animations and hyperlinks and what this then means is that you can chain a lot of these animations and a lot of these hyperlinks together. In fact, over 1,600 of these. And then you can do some really fun things. And I didn't make this. It was a, by a very talented person called Tom who made a, a fully working punch card system to code a Turing machine in PowerPoint using just animations. One of the examples of this is his palindrome recognizer. And what it does is if I input an even palindrome, so for example, zero and zero and run it, all I need to do is click on the orange and it will gradually move through the Turing machine going from state to state, reading and writing, just simulating what a Turing machine might be doing on the inside. And eventually what will happen is, is because I inputted the palindrome zero, zero, what will eventually happen is we reach an accepted state. And to prove that this is not just me just doing some random stuff, even if I knew how on earth to animate even that, um, if you reset it and do a fake one such as like one, zero, we know that's not obviously not a palindrome, but if I were to go through it again, so just moving through states, nothing like, I say nothing special. It's very special what's happening. I'm not entirely sure how you even think of this, but he did. And we reach a rejected state, which means that PowerPoint is Turing complete just on its own, no visual basic required. And this is an interesting thing is because PowerPoints can do everything, can do literally anything because it's Turing complete, it technically violates the app store's terms of conditions because it says that 
something on the App Store cannot simulate a multi-app widget and or like a desktop or home environment for security reasons. But PowerPoint can, so technically it should be gone from the App Store, which is kind of weird. <laughs>